So we do have Joel Pearson as uh, as our platinum sponsor speaker. Right now, let me let me go ahead and share a video that that we have. Big Commerce, and the the topic today will be about making your website your best salesperson. So it's almost like a, in parallel, a kind of extension of what we just had with Dave Bent. So Joel Pearson, he's the Vice President of Sales for the Americas for Big Commerce. He brings 18 years of experience driving sales revenue, building teams, and staying focused on his customers. He is known for his sales achievements and leaderships in the SaaS industry. So Joel Pearson, I'd like to welcome you on stage and. Um, Looking forward to this to, the, to this presentation. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here for now my second consecutive year. Uh, I'm really looking forward to having this time to share a little bit about our perspective on how you can leverage your website to drive revenue and, and increase conversion events. And what a phenomenal job. First to Kali, I wanted to say thank you for that refreshing break in the day. And also Dave, uh, what, a, what a great presentation. Uh, it's without any practice or, or even any awareness of what Dave was presenting, it seems like a very nice segue into the topic that we're going to cover today. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. And so a bit of a provocative title, right? Especially if you think about somebody who, oops, let me go back one more, somebody in a position of managing sales teams and has had a, a long tenure and identifying and hiring talent. Uh, so I want to say that, well, I'm a big proponent of Made to Stick and I hope this grabbed your attention. I by no means believe that your website will absolutely replace the best salespeople you have in your organization. But what I do believe is that we can look at the attributes that make them your top salespeople and replicate some of those characteristics and bring that into your e-commerce site experience to drive a lot of positive results. Now you can imagine why we went with this title. What I just said in that second half of the sentence, too long to put on a slide, but I hope as we go through here, you'll see that there's uh, two primary areas that we're gonna focus on and what comprises our great characteristics in salespeople. And then the three ways that you could apply that in a ways that will be meaningful to your online presence and footprint. Okay, so that is the topic today. And we're gonna go through. Um, if you didn't get a lot from the video itself though, I thought if you could indulge me for just a, a minute or two to share a little bit about who we are as a company. So while Tim uh, did a great job of uh, giving a little bit of uh, uh, insight into my background, and Tim, if I ever hire a hype man, you're going to be first on my list. Uh, but I did want to share a little bit about our organization. And so there's a lot of the uh, who we are that you can see represented in this slide. So you know, in existence for a little over 10 years, hiring about 750 of the best and brightest out there, present company excluded, of course. And then with our most notable accomplishment recently with getting our listing on uh, NASDAQ, which was a tremendous accomplishment by this organization and, uh, and a great job by the thought leadership and the direction that our C-suite has really helped take this uh, big commerce from a really a startup initiative 10 years ago to a company now that's serving over 70,000 merchants on our platform. But if I could leave you with two main takeaways about who we are and why it's important is one, we, we're fundamentally and uniquely positioned different than any other SaaS platform or e-commerce platform in the market today. Uh, we coined a phrase called open SaaS. And while that sounds a bit nebulous, uh, the nuance of it is really important. And so if you think about what we're trying to convey here is that we're, as a platform provider, are gonna give you all the benefits that you would get under a traditional SaaS platform. So hosting, security, compliance, bug fixes, product updates, all those things that you, know, you would want in an e-commerce experience. But then we marry that with the best elements of what you would get from open source. And what is that? Configurability. And the ways to customize your platform to meet the uniqueness, the unique characteristics of your business. And that is really important because we can do that at a lower total cost of ownership than anybody else in our space. And so we really have uh, this kind of niche and, um, advantageous position in the market. And that advantageous position in the market really also helps fuel 
what we can do from a B2B perspective. Uh, I love Dave, I did not pay Dave for his endorsement of what to look for uh, as you're looking at e-commerce platform providers, but there were a couple mental notes I made. And ones that I, I think if I could give you the second takeaway would be around this concept of our relevance to the B2B merchant. He mentioned delivery of new features. And what I really loved about that is we're an organization that roughly year over year takes about 40% of our revenue and reinvest that into our core e-commerce platform and capabilities. The other thing he mentioned was SEO. And uh, from, you know, again, I'm a bit biased, but our platform delivers some unparalleled SEO capabilities. And then this idea of customer segmentation and price list to create personalization, which is inherently built into our platform as well. And so that approach of our go-to-market strategy and how we've been trying to be purpose-built also for the B2B merchant has been recognized out there. You can see that whether it's Forrester, Paradigm, IDP, uh, Marketscape, these are ways that our approach to the market has been validated. So with that, uh, further than I'm very excited to have our, uh, go through the rest of our presentation today, I'd be remiss if I didn't jump in to the elements or the basically considerations I wanna walk you through without some additional validation around why it's so important to take these considerations to heart as we talk through the B2B landscape and some of the current trends. So as we kind of segue into this portion of our conversation, this is probably things that you guys are pretty aware of, so I won't belabor the point, but probably worth spending a little bit of time talking to. So on our first slide here, as you can see, what a growth market it is. And, and the B2B businesses that are moving online are on a high trajectory of seeing uh, GMP or online revenue really um, excel and grow and accelerate. Uh, some of this is obviously, as we look at some of the stats here, this isn't really even taken into account the impact that things like COVID has done to impact or further accelerate the growth of online revenue. And by 2023, about 17% of all revenue that's going to be picked up is going to be done online. So that uh, if you remember if any of those attended last year's session, I talked about some of the essentials of built, you know, building your online footprint or taking your business online. Today, we're going to evolve that a little bit more. But as you can see, as I hope what this helps validate, the timing is right to take action. Whether you're going to be new to online or you're going to be evolving your business, the time is absolutely at hand to take advantage of the growth in the market. And Tim, I see comments and questions coming through as I can't see specifically what those are. If there's anything that where I need to pause or do a deep dive on, please let me know. All right, so what I also wanted to do is talk about uh, this real quick this McKinsey report around the new digital reality. Uh, there'll be a link in there as we send over the presentation. Absolutely worthwhile looking at it. It really breaks down about nine different charts that take you through how both the buyers and sellers are having a greater affinity for this kind of new interaction and, and sales conversion events that are happening in a more kind of a um, online perspective for lack of a better term. And so if, and if we really look at it from the B2B perspective, or I mean, from the buyer perspective, uh, what was really unique about as you dig, dig into it is even in this time where you think it might be you're losing some of the ha more hands-on approach about having your salespeople more directly interact. What was really uh, unique about what they're finding out there is that people have found it easier to get information, to place orders, to arrange service, and they just found that this ease of use has really suited their lifestyle under this new normal. And so when you think about these, these kind of the requirements for the new digital realities that, that they kind of uh, outline there, what it really meant was that we're seeing that more and more B2B merchants are taking a director consumer approach to their website and their e-commerce initiatives. And so, and it's almost becoming table stakes now that this evolution from what you would expect from an experience going to anywhere from a retailer online is now what they wanna see from somebody who's more on that B2B, maybe manufacturing, even just distribution standpoint. Uh, what I also liked about this is that they, uh, in this report, really breaks down the importance of serving up relevant information along the consideration cycle for your buyer. And I think Dave was even kind of alluding to some of this in his presentation as well, is that at the end of the day, they want to be able to easily consume information and have an easy path to purchase, all delivered or wrapped in an environment and experience that is very similar to what they would see on a direct-to-consumer website. 
So again, if you get a chance, I highly recommend it. We'll have the link in, the, uh, in our presentation for you to go out to. So when we start looking at this now, I have this provocative topic, so um, we have to spend some time covering it and why I think there's some great applicability here. But uh, again, if you were able to attend last year's session, you know that we had a very topical story to tell last year. I had a chance to present and uh, we were just entering this phase of the economic uncertainty tied to COVID. And it was a very unknown period of time. But what we were talking about last year was uh, we could learn a lot from history. And that this, while the COVID was a new method of driving this uncertainty, we've experienced this before. We had the Great Depression and we told, we told the story around what P&G did during that time and how they really doubled down on some of their advertising efforts to position themselves as the top category provider in their spaces and now are a huge giant in the consumer packaged goods space. So our story today is gonna to be a little bit different. It's gonna be based today though on uh, the experience I've had and the privilege I've had of hiring one of the best salespeople I've ever had the privilege of hiring and then managing. Uh, Aaron is his name uh, for privacy purposes. I won't share his last name, but as we go through a little bit, before I tell you the story of Aaron, uh, I think as I as we think about our top salespeople, there are probably characteristics that come to mind for all of us, right? And some of those will be very specific to the job you're hiring for, but then there are these like trans, uh, these kind of characteristics that transcend the job that are kind of the baseline requirements for typically what you, you might look for in hiring somebody. These are definitely the standards for me. I've even built models around it to try to get to the heart of, do they have some of these baseline requirements? Because I knew from my history, if I had people that fit this mold, I could produce success out of them. And so when I looked at some of those characteristics, some of the things that stood out to me were our proven track record of success. Whether that was related in the industry I was in, whether that was even in sales, did they have by some measure, that uh, some degree that could be measured, a history of success? The one I love the most is the second bullet point, grit and tenacity. Hard to always un uh, uncover during an interview process. I did, typically would do unique things of having people tell me their, their life story and their history and some of the things that would go outside of your traditional interview. So I could get a sense for their ability to really overcome situations. Are they highly driven? Um, you know, in sales, most of the time you've got coin operated machines, which is a great thing to have because you can incent the behavior you want, but high drive is really important to me. Uh, and are they able to take a consultative approach? I usually have people in a scenario that I'll, I'll outline for them, take me through how they would position things with me. And more than often than not, the ones that are able to really spend time more asking questions than presenting at me, have this at a high degree, that consultative approach, and typically do really well in sales. All right, so I, I, I told you I was gonna tell you a little story about a, a gentleman named Aaron. Well, first and foremost, uh, Aaron was re referred to me by somebody that I had a longstanding re relationship with. They thought really highly of Aaron, but Aaron had zero sales experience at the time he and I were being introduced. But what Aaron did have through a, I could uncover in a series of conversations with him, he had all of those characteristics that I'm outlining to the left. Even more, he was coachable, willing to learn, other attributes that you guys, I'm, I'm sure, also uh, highly weigh. But as I brought Aaron on board, started onboarding him, uh, watching him grow, the two things that really stood out to me were uh, uh, kind of surprise areas for me. They're not surprising in the fact that it's what you want in a salesperson. What was surprising for me is how quickly he was able to adapt and bring these to fruition and, and really make them part of his day-to-day -day job. Now, again, before I move on to those two qualities, if you look to the left, a lot of the things that I've outlined there, I will admittedly tell you are hard to just ultimately like bring into your side experience. Maybe the consultative approach you could loosely tie to how well your product descriptions are, that they convey enough confidence to people, give them enough information and make a buying decision. Maybe I could loosely make that argument. Where I think I'm better positioned is in these areas that Aaron brought to the table. Aaron did a phenomenal job in every sales engagement in uh, establishing a clear line of differentiation between what we did and how our competitors did. Uh, maybe to hopefully do a halfway decent job when I started doing the introduction to big commerce, I set that foundation a little bit early in, in our meeting, talking about how we take a fundamentally different approach to the market via open SaaS. 
Aaron did a phenomenal job, always making sure, even in the cases where we didn't win, people still knew there was differentiated value that we brought to the table. And the other thing that he did is that he really aligned incredibly well with each buyer and where they were at in their consideration cycle and buyer's journey. And I think these are things that are fundamentally can be done and be done successfully uh, in your e-commerce experience. Okay, so hopefully everybody's with me so far. Uh, and hopefully I dispel the uh, provocative statement of faith that we can replace your best salespeople, but we can absolutely learn from it. All right, so we're gonna jump in a little bit more and talk about how. So if we talk about that, uh, Dave was also, again, we did not have to take a chance to collaborate on any of our collateral prior to the sessions today, but differentiation can absolutely be established via experience. And I think it is something that is, um, it's growing in the B2B space, it's getting better, but we're seeing more and more merchants really adopt this uh, and apply this in ways that are, that are specific to their business, but it's not pervasive by any stretch of the imagination. And when you think about the experience of mine, you wanna really de de design that experience with the customer journey or with them in mind. So if you think about why this is important, I think, uh, again, I, I won't read this all to you, but it's pretty stark and clear that there's a lot of validation points out there as to why this approach matters. The reality is this is exactly what your B2B buyer is growing to expect more and more. So you might as well meet them in a way that will engage them more and give them the confidence that they can move forward with purchasing you over your competitors. So if you look at this, what is maybe kind of an example that can drive this home and really increase engagement and conversion? Well, there's multiple ways. And so as, this, as we go through here, this will kind of um, start scrolling through, but there's easy ways that you can make it um, really engaging for your potential customers to engage with your products, get the information they, move, they need and to move on. And again, this is a B2B example that we're showing here, but for all intent and purposes, what you're looking at is something that could easily uh, replicate or be seen in any direct to consumer e-commerce experience. And so, again, it's just these little shifts in how you do it. And again, each business will be unique in how you have to apply this. So this is one example. But you can see things like this can really drive conversion on site, more time on site, and ultimately more revenue events and less abandoned cart. And as we look at other examples of this, one of what I wanted to really kind of draw home is this Verisair uh, example. Now, uh, they are an organization, as you can see, the portable partitions and dividers, probably not unlike a lot of the category of service or products that you, uh, uh, people on this call today would bring forward. But look at the subtle things that they do from a site experience perspective that can make it really easy for a buyer to say, yeah, I wanna move forward with this product. You can help them along, make the right decision the first time. So you can also negate the potential of having returns and exchanges on things because they didn't have the experience they needed up front to make that decision. But simple things like being able to set uh, a person against that backdrop, have the, uh, the width and height be adjusted, the color configuration, all of this makes it really easy for somebody to get to what they need and have the confidence to pull the trigger uh, and add to cart and ultimately make the purchase. And so beyond that, like there's a lot of other ways that you can think through it with your business. But if you start thinking about the very sites that you shop on today from a direct to consumer perspective, how can you start incorporating some of those experiences into your B2B site? And you will realize that there are gonna be great benefits along the way taking that approach. Okay, so this one was tying back into that overall creating differentiation through experience. This same product, if you were going to buy it on a competitive site where you didn't have this level of interaction, probably won't have the same conversion or the positive experience that we're, we saw represented in this one. So uh, again, Make sure it's relevant to your business, but these are just a couple of examples of how you could bring the D2C experience into your B2B side. All right, the next thing I want to talk about, and uh, Tim, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're still good on time, so maybe in 10 minutes. Okay, great. I think I can get through it in that time. The next thing I want to talk about is leveraging the influence of social. Uh, and now this may seem again, like what, what, you, know, you may look at your brands and not think about your brands as being inherently social, but there are elements and ways that you can do this effectively, regardless of the type of product that you are either manufacturing or distributing or ultimately selling. So let's talk about this a little bit. 
Um, I think in most cases, nobody argues that word of mouth has traditionally been the best advertising source out there. But what I, I will say is that social has become today's generation word of mouth. And so there are different ways to leverage quote unquote social. When I, when I first started uh, in this, uh, uh, in some one of my SaaS careers, I worked at a company called Bizarre Voice that did online product reviews. And at the time, was, this was years and years ago, um, I covered the Southeast territory for manufacturing. And most of the merchants that I would talk to at that time would think social was a cotillion. It was not on their radar at all. But times have changed and it's become really important to embrace your customer's voice to inspire other purchase decisions. And so beyond just reviews, there's a couple of ways we could do it, but I wanted to start with the concept of reviews because I think it's really pertinent and important when you think about B2B businesses. And so again, I'll let you guys kind of go through and uh, read some of the data here, but I want to tell another story. During that same time that I worked at that uh, company called Bizarre Voice, uh, I had an opportunity to go and meet with a manufacturer in the Southeast that made actuators and thermostat controls for commercial buildings. Not the type of thing that immediately stands out uh, as top of mind as, hey, that needs product reviews. But in having conversations with them, what I quickly could uncover is that they had a community of engineers and other people of certain titles that absolutely had an affinity for their product. And, uh, but they also knew there was a whole group of people out there that didn't want to just be told through a product page that this was a great product for them to buy. They wanted it reinforced by others like them. And when we're talking about decisions that are going to be made, you know, uh, large quantity of SKUs that are going to be purchased at one time, the importance of validation or getting that purchase done right the first time was really critical. Um, so almost like in that old concept, nobody get fired for buying IBM. People will need that same sense of comfort level when they're thinking about either, whether it's large dollar, uh, large dollar consideration items, they're buying in huge volumes. The more that they can have other people that are like them validate that this is a good decision, the more likely are they are to move forward. So that same organization believed they had that community. And I, I will say I had at the time in that company, I had some naysayers that thought, hey, is this really the right fit for a product? Well, within a very short amount of time, six, six months from when they implemented, they collected more reviews than um, one of the major uh, pharmacy type of stores that you would see out there that would have, naturally you would believe would have a lot more people that would act, congregate to their content. Not only did they outperform them, but they saw a huge spike in um, not only uh, by leveraging that for SEO benefits, drive site traffic, engagement on site, but ultimately sales conversion. And it had an impact on AOV because it created a halo effect, even on some of the other products that didn't have reviews on them. So again, think about it in terms of your business. Is there ways that you can collect customer sentiment? Leverage those on your product pages to increase conversion because when you do, it typically has a positive experience and it removes you from having to be the salesperson and lets others proactively share their positive experiences and sell on your behalf. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is this idea of just kind of social sharing or collaboration. If you did attend last year's uh, session, I did another, uh, during my segment, I did mention this company before, Fornida. Uh, and they're really cool in the sense that, yeah, this is a B2B um, merchant of ours that sells server, servers and a different type of hardware for organizations. And when you look at it, again, inherently, it doesn't stream social. But what they did was something really unique. And it wasn't what you see on the left-hand side where you can go through and go through all the configurations that you want for your server. That's pretty normal on table stakes. What they did is allowed you to take your configured product and share that out to your network to solicit feedback. And that simple step reinforced purchase decisions, reduced return rates and exchanges, and ultimately had a big impact again on their overall conversion rates. Something as simple as just taking that step and adding that experience was transformational for Fornada. And it's something that other uh, you, you as merchants can take into your, that as a consideration as well and look at, at, at its applicability into your business model. All right. And then of course, there, is, there are the traditional social formats out there. And again, you may be looking at your brand and saying, I don't think that we have any applicability here. And you may not, but many of you will. There might be something inherently social about your business or things that you haven't really thought about to make it more social. So here are three different 
examples, Farm Boy, Uplift Desk, Avery Denison, all of which uh, have big B2B component to their business model. And with that, uh, yet they're finding unique ways to leverage things like social for their businesses. So the Farm Boy example, that was really cool. They really talk about the farm, they do a thing called Farm Fact Friday, where they're uh, really highlighting different things in agricultural news or trends within the industry to keep people on top of things, right? And really serve as a resource to their community. Uplift Desk does a lot of things where they can show of really cool configurations, whether that be from an office layout perspective or an individual desk perspective, help inspire um, decisions and layouts for organizations. And then Avery Dennison, uh, they do a lot around, not, yes, they highlight a lot of their case studies on their site, but they do a lot around sustainability. So three unique brands with three unique deployments of how they're leveraging traditional now social formats to help uh, one, create differentiation, two, create affinity for their brand, and three, uh, also align with their buyers where they're at in the journey. If this is where somebody wants to engage, engage with them, right? So this is an opportunity then to create, again, that differentiation and meet somebody where they're at in their sales cycle. All right, so I think I only have about roughly five minutes left and we have one more consideration to go through. So hopefully you'll indulge me for just a few more minutes. And the last one we wanna talk about is the power of mobile. And this one probably seems like an absolute no brainer, but it's something that's not, uh, again, uh, being done well pervasively across the B2B landscape, but it can be. And it can be something that you leverage to the benefit of your organizations. And so, again, you can see the mobile stats. Um, as you look at it today, inherently more and more purchase decisions are being done by people from these devices, right? And it's where most people now even conduct their research all the way down through the actual purchase itself is being conducted from the, the cell phones. And so with that, it's important to make sure that you're engaging with people where they are. So if we go back to that sales experience, our first one was experience was everything. That was differentiation. Social creates differentiation and, and helps you engage with people where they may be at in the consideration cycle. This is absolutely engaging with people where they might be in the consideration cycle and how they actively buy, right? So I call it fish where there are the most fish. And this is an opportunity if you do it right and you think about how that ties back to the overall experience, again, it can create differentiation for your brand as well. So as we go through a little bit more, on the left-hand side is the old experience that many of us at one point uh, encountered. Hopefully, maybe not what your, you know, what your mobile experience represents today, but it doesn't do a lot to help people with those. Remember the new digital age, easily access information, right, get to the purchase path quickly and have a better experience. Then you benchmark that to what's on the right, right, where I can quickly get to the, the content that I want to see, the product category I want to dive into, and from there, the rest of their experience mirrors the ease of use of your seeing from that front, from that front tab. This has now become the table stakes, whereas at one point, it was satisfactory for us to have this type of environment to B2B, you saw it quickly go away from the director consumer perspective. Now the expectation is from your buyer today is to move over to something that's more engaging, easier to access information for, and creates a clear path to conversion. All right, so, and we can do see, again, I can show example of example of how this can be done. Resnet, they're in the business of providing breathing apparatuses to basically non-hospital agencies, right? So your, your care facilities and some of these other organizations that again, doesn't look like something that is traditionally, you think about it, having this enhanced mobile experience, but that's exactly what they wanted to create. So whether it is you're early on in the process and you need to be educated more, all the way down to ease of use to get down how it works and why this is the right, this particular SKU is the right recommendation for me. And there's a lot of ways that you can go about this that are very cost-effective, other ways that are more expensive, but just simply making sure that, your, that same uh, degree of differentiation you would have your salesperson on a phone create, you wanna create that experience and the mobile experience as well. And by doing that and making it really easy to get down the purchase path, again, it's going to have very positive impacts on the revenue and conversion rates for your organization. So I, I, Tim, I think I may be at time, but I would definitely want to open it up for any questions if there were any as well. Yeah, for sure. That was a great presentation, Joel. And uh, if, well, if there are any- Well, thank, thank Dave for setting the stage for me. He did such a great job.
Yeah, you warmed it up. You guys, uh, you guys were definitely in, in sync. So that, that was great. If there are any questions, uh, I don't think any of them came in today uh, for, for yours. But if you guys have any questions, do fill it out on the Q&A tab at the bottom. And then uh, we'll be sure to have uh, you know, all of our speakers um, answer them. So Joel, thank you so much again. Thank you for the support. We love working with Big Commerce, and it's always uh, it's always great to really work with you guys with all these sessions. And we miss well, we, uh, we, we value awesome. this. And uh, in the uh, to follow up to the words of Kali, Namaste, everybody. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> great. It's great to have uh, Big Commerce. Um, you know, the last event that we had with them was in LA as well, and that was that was great. And um, Big Commerce, they they have some swag stuff. So you know, if you guys didn't catch it from the beginning, we do have a swag box for all the merchants, distributors, manufacturers, wholesalers, and we'll be, we will be sending those out uh, post event. So if you didn't include your t-shirt size or, or even um, your address, do let us know right away because we're going to try to ship these out maybe by Thursday to Friday. So lots of great stuff in there. We, we have some of these t-shirts that we have right here. We have the Rhino plush toys. So lots of great content. So, and again, I just want to thank all the sponsors, big commerce uh, as our platinum sponsors. Gorgeous, Avalara, and APS Payments as our as our gold sponsors, and Dot Digital, Punch Out to Go, ShipStation, Medicake, and DC Cap Chloris as our silver sponsors. But yeah, that's it. That's it. That we. That's all that we have for today. Looking forward to uh, to the next one. Um, you know, we do have events on a monthly basis, smaller ones called e sessions, so specific case study examples for B two B and distributors. If you want to even have us analyze your company and do a case study, do let us know, you know, we, we would love to sh showcase and highlight your company. And then uh, we should have another e-summit in April that we do two big ones every, every year. And um, yeah, just, we're glad that we, um, for all you guys to join us for this one and we look forward to the next one, but that's it. That's it. That's all that we have for now. And we look forward to another, uh, another great event. You guys stay safe out there. We'll see you soon.